This is a view from the bunker. Now, here's Derek Gilbert. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. What exactly do those verses mean, and uh, how do we interpret them from a divine counsel perspective? Welcome to A View from the Bunker. I'm Derek Gilbert. Joining me is uh, our regular panel for our monthly Iron and Myth Roundtable, the uh, pastor of the Reformed Baptist Church of Northern Colorado in Boulder and author of the, uh, the book we highly recommend, Giants, Sons of the Gods, now available in his 10th anniversary revised and expanded edition, Doug Van Dorn, award-winning screenwriter and novelist, best-selling novelist, Brian Godawa, and we're hoping that uh, Dr. Judd Burton, who is trying to log on with some new equipment, will be able to break through the defenses of the website here and get <laughs> join the conversation before this is all over with. Uh, gentlemen, welcome. The, the heavenly beings in uh, Psalm 29, verse 1. Now, the, I read the ESV version, but the King James Version renders it, Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty, give unto the Lord glory and strength. And that may be the version, the translation people are used to. And assume that the, uh, the psalm, this is a psalm of David, that David was simply referring to powerful kings, politicians, what, what have you. Um, and... Uh, I, I think there is, uh, I suppose, an argument to be made for that. But why should we take this as uh, the ESB translation, the heavenly beings? Uh, and, and what exactly is David trying to say in this psalm? Uh, Brian, you, you uh, suggested this as a topic of discussion here. Um, how do we interpret David's message? Yeah, well, I think, first of all... Um we, we need to realize that that very first verse, actually, even the ESV, I don't think is very correct because the Hebrew is B'nai el Elim, mm -hmm. which, as we know, <laughs> B'nai Elohim, B'nai Aha Elohim, sons of the gods, you know, mm -hmm. so, so this is already, you know, that sets us up to be in the, in the divine council, which is also not readily apparent, um, you know, um, but I, th I think what inspired me, you know, to talk to, to want to talk about, because I knew it was packed full of a lot of the kind of material that we've been talking about, and yet we haven't talked about it yet. And um, particularly, you know, it it is it is a passage that for a long time scholarship, biblical scholarship, has understood it to be a um, heavily a, a, a poem that heavily reflects or is connected to a Canaanite uh, poetry about Baal, the storm god. Hmm. Some have gone so far as to suggesting that the it is probably, I think Cross uh, has said this, that Psalm 29 is probably a literal poem written to Baal with the word Baal crossed out and the word Yahweh written in its place type of thing, right? And, and um, you mentioned and, cross. And that's Frank. That's the scholar Frank Moorcross, correct? Frank, Frank Moorcross. Yeah, I'm okay. sorry. Um, yeah. And, you know, and, and why, you know, I mean, I, I think there's a lot, there's a lot of ways to, to look at this. I don't think that's the case myself, but there's, there's so much connection that I have no problem acknowledging. Oh, you know, this is the, this is the language of the storm God and the sea and stuff that we that will talk about. And we'll look at that in a second. But I think one of the, the dominant reasons why is because this voice of Yahweh that appears seven times in the Psalm, the voice of or you'll read it in most, obviously most translations say the Lord, but it's the voice of Yahweh is over the waters. The voice of Yahweh is powerful. The voice of Yahweh is full of majesty. It breaks the cedars. The voice of Yahweh flashes forth flames of fire. Um, you know, that, that, uh, that is a reflection of the, there's seven times and it talks about the God of glory thunders. And the argument is that this is a reference to the seven thunders of Baal, which is a reference in the uh, epic of Baal, you know? And so there, there's, that's a strong comparison, though there, though there is not an actual poem that we know of about Baal. The, there's a singular reference to, you know, the, the, the seven thunders, the eight lightning. F no, it's actually the seven lightnings, the eight thunders of Baal. 
Um, but that's a sort of a poetic phrase. So that's kind of a, an interesting thing to launch us into it. But, you know, you started reading it, but I say, let's, let, let me go ahead and read it. And then you can, we can enter it more into the discussion because I think it's a beautiful Psalm and it's short enough. So it starts out, ascribe to the Lord, O sons of God, <laughs> ascribe to Yahweh glory and strength, ascribe to Yahweh, the glory due his name, worship Yahweh in the splendor of holiness. The voice of Yahweh is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. Yahweh over many waters. The voice of Yahweh is powerful. The voice of Yahweh is full of majesty. The voice of Yahweh breaks the cedars. Yahweh breaks the cedars of Lebanon. There's a lot of parallelism going on where there's a, a phrase and then the repetition in new words that's going on here or a reiteration. The, vo the voice of Yahweh breaks the cedars. Yahweh breaks the cedars of Lebanon. That's an example. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. That word for Syrian is a reference to Mount Hermon in, in the Hebrew text. The voice of Yahweh flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of Yahweh shakes the wilderness. Yahweh shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of Yahweh makes the deer give birth and strips the forests bare. And in his temple, all cry glory. Yahweh sits enthroned over the flood. Yahweh sits enthroned as king forever. May Yahweh give strength to his people. May Yahweh bless his people with peace. So that's the, that's how it opens up. But uh, I, I don't know where you, where you want to go with this, but there's a lot we can talk about. I think that, you know, just on the surface, there's about five different elements that are strong Canaanite elements, or shall we say that are uh, very similar to Canaanite uh, storm language related to Baal. And we can look at each of those individually if you want. Uh, first, want to welcome Judd into the conversation. Glad you finally broke through our defenses. You, uh, we, we, we tried to lower the shields and we're having trouble doing it, but uh, you managed to get through, so that's good. Change, reverse the pol yeah, reverse the polarity on your login or something to get through. Or glad to be here. New, new. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know. Welcome. Uh, at any rate, uh, I'm here. <laughs> this is one of those things that is, uh, I, I think a little difficult for, for Christians in the pews to, to uh, absorb. I mean, uh, Doug, how do your, how would your congregation or how does your congregation respond when you point out verses in the Bible that, uh, Hey, look, you know, uh, this Psalm or, or this passage in Isaiah comes directly out of the bail cycle. Yeah. I mean, I preached this uh, five, six years ago and went through the whole thing and, I mean, I was not shy about any of what Brian said. In fact, I was rereading it earlier today, and I quote this guy named Gadawa a couple of different times. <laughs> but it's actually in, in relation to uh, the, the write-up you did on Aronofsky's movie, actually. And I was looking at it from the point of view of subversion, that that's really what this psalm is. And so you have to do certain things with people to uh, to get them to understand what's happening. You have to explain the idea of subversion. Why, why would you even use such a thing? Put it into a context that helps them see that um, uh, if they were to go and read critical commentaries on Psalm 29, that, that this isn't the Israelites trying to stomp out polytheism in their religion or you know, some, of the, just some of the bizarre things that people come up with in order to make the text not say what it actually says, to understand that when it's actually subversive, it's, it's an incredibly powerful form of argumentation that that explains the power of Yahweh, which is what we just read about. So you have to do some background like that. Um, for this particular psalm, one of the things that I found was really important was to help people get a hold of the geography of the psalm. Because when you look at the geography, now all of a sudden... You, you're you're uh, in, in the objective text. You're not able to make anything up. So when you see that the whole thing is about a storm theophany of God coming in a storm, don't even bring in the bail cycle at this point yet. Just look at where the storm is. So it comes over the sea, and then it comes over uh, Lebanon, which appears to be in Mount Lebanon in the, in the north, uh, today's, today's uh, modern country of Lebanon. 
the storm goes down south, it ends at Mount Hermon, which is called Sirion. And then really the last piece of geography that you get is this place called Kadesh. And a lot of people think that this is the famous Kadesh Barnea, which is really in the Egyptian desert. But actually that's not true at all. It actually refers to a place that they excavated in the early 2000s called Tel Kadesh, which is actually on the western side of the Hula Valley that has a wonderfully beautiful view of Mount Hermon. So that's the geography of this thing and when you when you when you realize that the geography is centered and focused on uh you know bashan on the the ancient land of the canaanites now all of a sudden you're able to bring into that for people in the pew other things like the bale cycle and why the storm theophany might be coming over this particular geographical region and when you do that now you now you have the makings for some pretty powerful stuff to talk about. That is interesting. I had not considered Tel Kadesh. And one of the reasons I find this so interesting is because uh, Sharon and I, in our forthcoming book, are, are looking at that valley. Well, it, as the reason, one of the reasons we went to um, the the Shamir uh, Dolman Field outside the kibbutz Which in is the on northeast the part. Side. It's on the eastern side of it, yep. <clears throat> Right, right, is that, that valley that the Jordan River runs through that used to be the uh, Hula Marsh, it's now just a valley, a very lush mm-hmm. farmland, was surrounded on both sides by, uh, I think they discovered like 1,100 dolmens, which are these megalithic funerary monuments. But we think that is the valley of the shadow of death. I mean, when Jesus moved to Capernaum right. at, the, at the south end of that valley... Matthew said it fulfilled the prophecy in Isaiah 9, that those dwelling in darkness have seen a great light, those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. And given that it's David who wrote this, who also wrote the 22nd Psalm, the prophetic Psalm of the uh, the crucifixion, you know, many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. Um, and then that's, of course, followed by the 23rd Psalm, which re- references the valley of the shadow of death. Okay, now now we're starting to see puzzle pieces fit together. This is fascinating. And I think that's the point, right? That that if you can ground the text in something objective, which it gives you all this geography, now you're able to start making sense of some of the weird things that are found in it, starting in that first verse, which is the B'nai Elim and the sons of God. Why might they be there? And and some of the other strange things there, like the, uh, the, the uh, bull or the, the calf, whatever. I mean, this is a really weird word, the word Raim, which is translated in the King James and in the Septuagint as a unicorn. Mm-hmm. What in the world's going on with that? Why, why would you do that? And and I have this, I actually have a theory of why they might have done it, because in a subversive kind of uh, astronomical way, um, with Canaan being linked to uh, through, through the words um, that are used for a dog, it's linked to Sirius the dog star, and mm. so Canis Major and Canis Minor, well, what's right between those mm. two in the constellations? What well, happens to be a unicorn? So uh, could this be some sort of a taunt that is going on um, even in the usage of words like you find in the middle of the voices thundering that God is uh, going right after uh, the gods of the Canaanite? Well, let me let me make this even more strange. That, uh, that uh, Hebrew word Re'im, refers to not just oxen, but to the aurochs, which is that ancient strain of cattle that went extinct in the 16th century, that uh, where the bulls stand about six foot high at the shoulder. Um, they were all over Asia and Europe back in the day. And it appears that the Akkadian name for that particular animal, which in uh, with without vowels was, was transliter- is transliterated into English as DDN, the Estonian scholar Amar Anus argued that that was the origin of the name of the ancient uh, Amorite tribe, the Tadanu, from which the Greeks got the name of their old gods, the Titans. So you've got this, you've got this uh, bovid imagery connected to the gods of the Canaanite, but also the Mesopotamian gods that was transferred over to the Greek gods, even Kronos, who was the king of the Titans, uh, Nicholas Wyatt, scholar from the University of Edinburgh, argues, derives his name for the Semitic word k- karnu, meaning horns. 
one. Well, and, and to throw this, throw some more context into this, the, these would have been the, the megafauna that, that would have been around during the time of the Watchers and the, the first generation of pre-flood giants. So there is, there's a, another piece of, of <laughs> sinewy bovine goodness that connects, connects us to all this weirdness in the, in the, not, not just the, the identity of the aurochs, but the time in which the aurochs proliferated on the earth. Um, so tying this into to both what, what Brian and, and Doug and you, Derek, have pointed out, um, there's some interesting things to tease out of here. And if I could just footnote what, what Doug and Brian had said about um, what I think they were talking about when I came on about the, the literary idioms of the day. People tend to get a little scared about shared literary traditions and, and shared uh, usages of, of language, shared shared phrasing, um, particularly when they see this kind of phraseology in, in other other literature, so-called you know that were clearly pagan literature, not not so-called literature, showing up in the Bible. Um, but there's this only helps us as, as I, I may have missed, but I think that, that both Brian and Doug were illustrating. This only helps us to further understand the the biblical world world and the context against yeah. which which something like Psalm twenty nine is being laid. Um, you know, let me give um, let me give one more thing very, here. And very Brian, interesting I'm sure stuff. You're going to go into the bail cycle stuff a lot, but I don't know that this is going to be brought up. So I think it's an, an interesting point based on the fauna stuff you brought up. Judd, that when you read the Septuagint, it actually has a little bit longer introduction. It says the Psalm of David on the occasion of the solemn assembly of the tabernacle. And I thought that's really interesting because, as I, as I know we'll <laughs> talk about at some point, the Baal cycle is really centering at least part of it on when Baal gets his victory over his his uh, brother Yom, the sea, uh, he builds a temple. And, uh, you know, you've got these cedars of Lebanon that are in this psalm. Like, well, what are those? Well, you're going to read what Solomon built his temple out of, and you have the cedars of Lebanon. So you have a whole lot of sanctuary uh, language, worship language, that's just further impressing what you find in the Baal cycle, but it's subverted so that it's not Baal and El and Asherah who are being worshipped, but he actually has the, is the only one that has the power over them. A slight clarification on that, Doug, is um, so actually in the Septuagint, the Psalm, Psalm 29 is actually Psalm 28 in the Septuagint. Yeah, that's true. Yep. And so now Psalm 29 does talk about the concept. It opens with the consecration of the temple of David, but Psalm 28, the one we're actually reading actually well, you're right. says, I, think I read the wrong one, didn't I? Yeah. It's commemorating the feast of Exodus yep. of the temple. That's so right, that's I mean, right. it still is related to the temple, but the feast of Exodus and, but that's very important too, because by the way, I, I didn't know this. <laughs> until you pointed this out and I'm looking at it. And of course, to me, there's a lot of other connections going on. And, and the Exodus is key because Psalm 74, which we've talked about many times before, it has the same uh, motifs that are going on with a victory of the waters, including Leviathan and including, um, and, and it's related to the Exodus as the, you know, uh, you, the creation of the covenant and so it's got these same components. In fact, other scholars have pointed that out, that Psalm 74 contains these same elements. Um, so I think that that makes it just even more relevant. But the element, so here's one of the reasons why I don't think, it, it doesn't matter to me, but uh, if this was a actual poem of Baal that was just, you know, change the name type of thing. Cause it doesn't mean that, that they, you know, it could still be polemical, like we're saying, but the reason why I don't think it is, is because I think that the motifs of that we're looking at here in this Psalm is a very universal motif that also is reflected in other Psalms, including Psalm 74, like I mentioned, and also Habakkuk three and Psalm 93. And those, those, the, that motif is you have the storm God with victory over the waters. 
And sometimes there's reference to thunders, but certainly there are theophanies through nature. And that storm God, after the victory over the waters, there's an enthronement of some kind and or a, um, a house of some kind created for him. And the house is the throne. And then an establishment of order or establishment of his regime of power to some degree. Um, and oh, and before all that, too, there's often the the very beginning, there's the assembly of L. There's the divine council. This this is the motif that it goes throughout a lot of the Canaanite, um, you know, poetry, as well as actually Babylonian. So there are there are many other examples. But my point is, is this thing of the, the, the storm God over the waters enthroned as king. And, and that's a, a lot of times that enthronement is a climax. N- not always. Sometimes it also ends with uh, a reference to his protection of his people. This is, in, this is in, in all these, these, um, whatever this storm God, you know, uh, victory motif type of thing. And that's, what's kind of cool is that, uh, not to take it too afar, but you know, um, Psalm 93 has these components as well. Um, And Theodore Gaster was a a scholar that I I read in an an article on this where he talks about how Psalm 93 also has the floods being lifted up. 93 verse 3 and 4. The floods have lifted up, O O Yahweh. The floods have lifted up their voice, mightier than the thunders of many waters. Psalm 93 too talks about your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. His throne establishment. Psalm 93 4 talks about the thunders of the many waters and the establishment of the world. Your throne is established from of old you are from everlasting so like i said these these are powerful um you know i i think you know words of praise that that i I, quite frankly i use them in my own worship of of god you know because of that you uh ubiquitous motif but that's why you know that's where we can say okay this is this is just a common cognitive environment of the ancient near east this is how they worship their gods and we're all humans and we do things very similarly, you know? So there's nothing to be afraid of in, in noting these similarities. Um, and, and I think that's the advantage of where we're coming from in, in that, um, one, you know, one of the problems that I think we address here in this iron and myth is precisely that, uh, the, there's a, a history of evangelical scholarship afraid to efface some of these similarities with pagan neighbors of Israel because they're afraid to admit these similarities because I think they're afraid that that will make it look like the liberals are right. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it just evolved out of polytheism, all that stuff. But, but there's no need to understand it that way. And, and there's no need to be afraid of not facing these. And when we don't face it, it's going to end up hurting more of the faith because when Christians do find out these similarities, they go to college and they take their comparative religion Mm -hmm. course, right? They see the truth there and it's like this has been held back from me and and they can oftentimes lose their faith because they've they've created this false dichotomy yes there is a dichotomy in a sense obviously between the god of scripture and the, the pagan god surrounding but there's also a similarity and we must not be afraid of learning what we can from those similarities and i'm going to great pains to say this because you know i don't know about you guys but i run into this a lot and and it's a lot of responses to my writings. That's what I get. People just Christians are just afraid to do this, to, to face this similarity and connection. And they don't realize, oh, no, 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 you can, you don't, it, there's more, more than one way to skin a cat, more than one way to interpret similarities. And so don't be afraid of facing those facts. Funny, Brian, you, uh, I made this exact point in the sermon. I mean, identical point to people that if you ignore this, it's not going to make it go away. The bail cycle is what it is. It exists whether you care about it, to talk about it or not. And people will find out about it. And when you don't have answers for it and you pretend that it doesn't exist, that's just uh, you know, it's the first step into atheism or, or paganism yeah. or whatever else people are going to go. Yeah. So. And, and, and this isn't, these are actual, you know, significant evangelical scholars who do this, who dismiss this yeah. material, you know, and that's when I see that it just is so like, oh my gosh, it's dark to me because I'm like, these guys, they're, they're 
yeah, they're, they're paving the road for, for a loss of faith for a lot of Christians, you know. Sharon and I've tried to make a point during our weekly Bible study of pointing out whenever we come across these verses that, that are clearly storm God language, because it's woven all through Scripture. I mean, uh, there, there's another psalm, I think, that is just where it's just overloaded with it, and that's Psalm 68, which is similar to Habakkuk 3. Yeah. Okay, our dog Grace is sleeping next to me here, and she's apparently having a dream, which is shaking the table. So if my picture <laughs> shakes, it's because Grace is chasing something. It's not the, it's not the storm, dream. the off. Yeah, it's, it's exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> added effect, yes. Yeah, I thought it was um, added. But added Psalm 68, effect. verse 7, O God, when you went out before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth quaked, the heavens poured down rain before God, the one of Sinai, before God, the God of Israel. That's very similar to Habakkuk 3, verse 5, when he marches forth from Timon. Um, but uh, it... it <laughs> You know, I, I had missed the reference to the seven lightnings and the eight thunders in the Baal cycle, because uh, even in Revelation chapter 10, you've got the seven thunders that John yeah. references that are sealed up for the time of the end. Yeah, yeah. And there's, you know, there's issues with that seven thunder. I mean, I don't think it needs to be. Um, it's somewhat problematic, right? You know, well, wait a minute. It's eight thunders, not seven thunders. So... You know, seven thunders in Psalm 29, but eight in, well, the, you know, the point there is that there's a parallelism, seven right. lightning flashes, eight bundles of thunder. And, you know, but there's scholarly arguments on both sides as I was looking into this that, you know, uh, it could be either the seven or the eight. That's the most important number. And that the second number is just another, you know, way of sort of exaggerating the, the, the point, you know, it's like it's seven, but really it's so much bigger than that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's fine. You know, like I say, I, I it doesn't need to be exact connection for my mind. Right. But, um, <clears throat> what you, what you bring up though, um, in Habakkuk three, it, it also has these same components. You know, you've got victory over the waters in Habakkuk three, eight was your wrath against the rivers. O Lord, mm -hmm, your anger mm -hmm. against the rivers, against the sea, Habakkuk three eleven arrows, which in the scripture, oftentimes, uh, the nature theophany is used arrows as a reference to lightning and thunder. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then Yahweh commanding his sword into action. And then upheaval of nature, Habakkuk 3, 7, he stood and measured the earth and looked and shook the nations and the eternal mountains. And yeah, so, so these, uh, again, you know, these, these, this motif, oh crud, I was, I was going to go somewhere with, oh, um, so another element that, you know, liberal scholarship for many years has sought to make is that they, they argue that, um, well, I'm not going to go down that, that path yet. Um, I just want to, I'll say this other thing. Um, since we're talking about storm language, Walter Propp, Walter oh, Propp crud. is a scholar who wrote this book and it blew, it was really fascinating to me. And I, you know, I haven't, I haven't double checked it lately, but I remember he made the argument that remember now that the, the Jews came out of Egypt, a land of dry desert, and he makes the argument that you don't start seeing a lot of that storm language until Deuteronomy, when they're entering into, into Canaan. So prior to that, there's not that much, there might be lightning and such, but, um, and certainly there's God's glory and all that, but he makes the, the, the argument that most of the storm language and God, the rain and the rivers and all that, that a lot of that, it begins when they're entering to the land, which is a land of rain, which is very, a very different geography and weather than they had in Egypt. And so again, this just reflects the, the contrast of, uh, what we're talking about, you know, the polemical contrast of the, the land which we're going into, God, Baal is not storm God, Yahweh is storm God. The confrontation, well, as you know, Brian, where, he, the, where uh, the Moses uh, is, is empowered by God or God, you know, tells Moses, okay, just park here opposite this place called Baal Zephon, and I'm going to part the, red, the sea, which is Yom, the Canaanite word for uh, the, the, the uh, chaos monster. The Hebrew word for sea is identical to the Canaanite word for 
their version of Leviathan. And he did it in front of a place apparently that was sacred to Baal, the storm god, who uh, looking historically at the history of Egypt, that part of Egypt was under the control probably of Amorites uh, called the, uh, the Hyksos during the time from Jacob down to just before Moses and the Exodus, whose uh, chief god was, was Baal. So even though, yeah. and, and they were probably sure. living in the land of Goshen, the Nile Delta, which is pretty green. You know, yeah, the rest fair of, enough. Yeah. The, the, re, the rest of Egypt is, is uh, pretty dry, but the, the Delta region is, is pretty, pretty sure. well watered. Yeah. Um, and I think it's interesting that even a couple of hundred years after the Exodus, you still had Ramses the Great erecting a stela, depicting his father venerating their version, their conception of Baal, depicted like the uh, Canaanite version of Baal. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, this this weaves all the way through, and you know, Judd, with the the um, geographic clues that Doug talked about, you know, putting this in the north, that you know, the Upper Galilee and Bashan, which we've discussed previously on this program, a region that's just pregnant with supernatural meaning. Um, what is the <laughs> significance there of the connecting that and that opening phrase, the Bene Elim sons? Sons of God, the, the ESV translates it heavenly beings, but as Brian pointed out early on, it uh, literally means in the Hebrew, sons of God or sons of gods. L, yeah. Sons of L. Mm-hmm. 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 Sons of L. Yeah, well, I, again, the, it's, it's not only the context of, of the biblical and the, the apocryphal material that, that sets this as the... the Ground zero for for Genesis six and and um, and Jesus's you know later firing of the warning shot over the bow of the enemy at Penea Caesarea Philippi, um, but it 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 brings us back to this connection that we've all been drawn out with with the Canaanite literature. Um, the um, the abode of ill, you know, as you've you've pointed out and written about, uh, Derek, in in your work, um, I'm trying to remember the exact Ugaritic reference. Um, it should be fresh on my mind because I, ju- I just wrote about it. Um, but the, uh, uh, um, the the geographical markers in this, um, I, I think it's the I, I want to say that it's the the reverence of a knot or something like it has something to do with bill and, and a knot. I think I can't remember the exact name of the, of the source. Um, but it, it speaks about the abode of ill and, um, the two deeps, which like you, I, I'm convinced, you know, the, it, it is a reference to, you know, the, the sea of Kenneth or the sea of Galilee and, uh, the hula, lake uh that was once there in, in ancient times but uh, th- yeah all of that seems to be part of this process of, of nailing down ritual geography and sacred geography and that region putting this into into a larger context but it also puts it into a context where um it, uh, when, when you when you look at the biblical material it puts it into a context of, of who is clearly in charge and above all of these other gods and that that's yahweh um this is even echoed in in instances in the new testament with, with jesus walking on the water of of the sea of kenneth the sea of galilee uh and literally you know stomping down you know controlling the storm uh while he's also stomping down on leviathan as he's walking around on the sea of galilee um that that not only makes those passages pop out more, but it, 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 you know, I think, I think as Brian was driving out and Doug too, uh, it, it, it anchors, it anchors the theology that we should all be drawn more towards, not, not so much the ones that are dictated by tradition, but the ones that are actually part of the, the cultural and historical context, the material that we're looking at, and indeed trying to live our lives. Uh, something to think about uh, to kind of go a little further with what we've talked about. One, one text that has not been brought up uh, is Genesis 1, 
Uh, and Genesis 1, you know, begins over the waters, just like this psalm does. Yes. And it takes place in seven days. Uh-huh. And we have the seven uh, voices. And then yeah. it finishes in an enthronement scene. And a lot of people miss this on the Sabbath because all they think about is Sabbath. But yeah. when you go and read the Baal cycle, it's very clear that what Baal's doing, he builds his house, his temple, in six days. And on the seventh day, he rests and is enthroned. And so really Genesis 2, 1 through 3, when God rests and he sees all that he's done and he's finished, it's an enthronement scene. And so it's fo- this psalm is following the same basic outline as creation. And what I think is really interesting is that you have uh, the New Testament telling us, and I believe they get it from the Old Testament itself, but it's very clear that the one who created in Genesis the Word is Jesus. And of course, he's called the word by John and and others. And here we have something very similar to the word. We have the voice of Yahweh. And I kind of wanted to save this till the end, but Jed really kind of, I think, necessitates that we talk about it. Uh, Here's a great place to do it, because in the New Testament, when Jesus is walking on the water, calming the storms, all these things that, that we've talked about before that he just alluded to, This is Jesus um, showing us that he's the fulfillment of Old Testament things. And when I think a lot of people read Psalm 29, they're not thinking Jesus. Mm -hmm. But that's that's exactly what they should be thinking. Because if we put this in its Canaanite context from the very first verse, and uh, Derek, you do this with, uh, um, I think, Psalm 82 one, uh, where it's talking about El. To me, it makes a lot of sense to translate the sons of God here as the sons of El, because mm-hmm. if this is a, some sort of subversion against the 70 sons of the Canaanite God, then what we have here is a battle of the sons. Okay. And we don't think along those terms, but it's a battle of the sons. If Baal is in mind in this mm-hmm. Psalm as the one who's being overthrown yep. or the one who's being conquered and not only Baal, but Yom as well, because the sea God is what starts it off. And mm-hmm. we've got Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh doing these things, and it's the voice mm-hmm. of Yahweh, then that what that's saying is that this is Jesus who is the one who is Yahweh in this text, and he's overthrowing these other sons of El because he is the supreme son. And then that is what's going on in the New Testament when Jesus starts doing these crazy things, especially up in his ministry in Galilee. So this is a very Christologically centered psalm that uh, is very easily missed and uh, just like so much else of the new of the old testament just because we haven't been taught to read it that way but i think that it's begging us to do that and uh like i i taught today i mean i was finishing up luke 24 and this is where jesus tells us that the whole scripture is about him uh starting in moses and the prophets and all the psalms and he's teaching us how to interpret the scripture not just here's a okay here's a turn in your Bible to Isaiah 53 yeah that's about me close the Bible you're done no he's teaching you how to read the Bible and the Bible is about him and if you don't read it that way then guess what Pharisees you don't have life because I am life and these are the scriptures that testify about me so sorry I'm doing a little preaching here but I mean this is right <laughs> on my it. mind and it's what I do for a living so there you go Amen you Amen know, you know, it's really interesting because on that topic, without going too Amen. far afield, is so I was listening to um, uh, the the Divine Council Worldview podcast, which is the so this is the podcast that is taking over from Michael Heiser. Yeah, now with Naked Ron Bible Johnson, is right. What, yeah, what with Ron Johnson? Yeah, yeah, with Ron Johnson. Yeah. Really good. I mean, really interesting. I don't agree with uh, everything that Ron says. In fact, one of the things that I don't particularly, uh, I, I only partially agree with him is his, one of his big emphasis is, you know, we need to read the old Testament text, um, uh, in its context. And as the, the initial readers would, would have understood it, which means they wouldn't, they wouldn't have this, the messianic implications on a lot of things and certainly not related to Jesus, you know, and he stresses it to a large degree, I think he overstresses it. And, and, you know, this is not a attack on him, obviously. It's just a disagreement that I, I was listening to his arguments. And I thought, well, that's a good point. I, do, I agree to a certain degree. However, 
In, in other words, we can often be importing too much of our own mindset into this stuff if we don't first understand it in its context and then apply Christ to it later type of thing. But there's another side that I thought, well, yes and no. Mm-hmm. No in the sense that, uh, so, so in other words, he was, you know, whatever, talking about Genesis and, and maybe even the, 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 you know, the, the seed of the serpent versus the seed of Eve and that kind of a thing. And he was sort of de-stressing that we shouldn't read the Messiah into it yet. That comes later down the line in terms of revelation and such. And I thought, well, I, w- I would disagree that we shouldn't put it off because since this revelation is a historical phenomenon and since Messiah has come, and he has fulfilled, then I think we cannot unsee that. The whole point is we must see him in the scriptures now as we read him. Um, and so I, I, I get what he's point. I, I also, but I would agree that, you know, sometimes pastor, um, I think pastors will often go overdo it in that that's all, it's just a tool to get to Jesus, right? Yeah. And I think that, that they're doing it improperly. Yeah, yeah. They're doing it the wrong way. I mean, if Jesus is Jesus is chastising both the Pharisees and his disciples for not seeing him, that yeah. seems to me to presuppose that they should have been doing this all along. And Fair yet enough. here we are in our seminaries telling our students, no, you're not supposed to do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I went off on this all day long today, guys. So. But I mean, you know, and I think this is a good point. <laughs> this is a good point because we are the guy, we are, all of us here are really big on, you know, ancient Near Eastern context. Let's understand the Bible, you know, and let's, you know, uh, so, but we have to realize, that, but that's the danger of being uh, caught up into, uh, you know, something that is not a complete understanding or worldview. You have to be careful in how you address that. Yeah, yeah. you know. Mm. So when you have uh, mm. when you have subversion going on in Baal, it's easy mm. to get lost in the wrong things, and that's kind of why I wanted yeah. to go in this direction at least at some point in this conversation. Because if Jesus is teaching us how to not get lost in that, and when you, like I said a minute ago, just kind of resummarize it, because I think it's really important to say in that context of an, an ancient Near Eastern context with El and his 70 sons. Uh, you know, I do this with Deuteronomy 32, uh, 7, 8, and 9, that I never actually saw uh, Mike do this, which always kind of puzzled me because he focused a lot on the sons of God. So that's a the direct connection to what we're looking at here today. But the very next verse says, but Yahweh, uh, 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 the Israel is his a portion, his allotment. Allotment. Well, what does that necessitate that Yahweh is there? He has to be the son because fathers don't receive an inheritance. And God as the generic being doesn't receive an inheritance. Only sons inherit things. And that's the whole point of verse eight, that the sons, sons. are inheriting the nations. And so yeah. it's like, when you get this Canaanite background, you are actually driven, forced to go in the direction yeah. of Jesus as the son. Awesome, it's exactly dude. the opposite of what these guys are saying that no you don't see him there because nobody would have seen him i think yeah, yeah. that i think you couldn't get any farther from what actor reality is that's mm, cool man mm. arise oh god judge the earth for you shall inherit all the nations I, yeah and in a, psalm 2 isn't it it's the son that inherits the nations that's exactly it's, right it's exactly yeah. right mm-hmm. and both wow. of those i'm are, so glad uh, i listened to this show because yeah. i learned there so much <laughs> <laughs> me too I was going to say, I, I had a Bible professor when I was at uh, Hardin Simmons, and he posed this question to the class one day, and it it never left me. It, I think about it a lot to this day. He said, if all you had was the Old Testament, could you lead somebody to Christ? And everybody in the room was just like, you know, stunned initially. And then it was sort of, yeah, well, maybe, but. Yeah, and then he, you know, he went on to to finish his point that that let, let's look at the duration of the first century A.D. before any any of the letters, much less the you know the gospels, begin to take liter, literary shape. That is still how it's done today That's with how it was done. witnessing mm-hmm. in Israel. Sure, and yeah, because they won't listen to the New Testament, it, right? Yes, yes, indeed, yes, indeed. So. I, I think that sort of brings us full circle in, in a way um, in terms of all of our, our, our com- 
commentary and, and even critique today um, is that, you know, as I think you were saying, Doug, uh, we, we can't, we can't unsee Christ in the old Testament. You know, we have to, yes, we have to get all that, that ancient area and forgive me if it was Brian, I can't remember. Um, but we have to, we certainly have to understand the, the ancient Near Eastern context, the Old Testament context, but we, we can't do that without Christ in the picture. That has to be the, the foundation, the anchor point, the, the cement, whatever oh, what? metaphor you want to use for our theology. Um, and it, it's a it's a challenge. You know, I think it's a challenge that needs to still be thrown out to the church. Is, is You know, could I... You, um, could you lead somebody to I Christ? To just... Um, I just got to say this, system. Doug, that you give me hope for pastors <laughs> because, <laughs> because honestly, I, it's hard. F I don't get a lot from pastors because of their mindset. is very much just, you know, very much all practical, you know, and, and there's nothing wrong with practical, but I'm just saying it's, they, they come to the scriptures and they have this agenda and it's all about Jesus. And, and I agree with that, but the way their approach, they, they don't seem to incorporate the, that, that fuller depth and make the Jesus be a, exciting to people like me rather than just the, well, how can we apply this? Right. You know, let's be loving like Jesus was loving type of thing. And to hear you speak, it's like, wow, I, I have hope now for listening to more, more pastors that can speak like you. Um, I, I appreciate that because you, you have that balance of the pastoral component without losing or diminishing the other required component, which would be that, you know, I don't know, I, I guess I would call it the, uh, um, this, whatever the scholarly understanding of the scriptures that, that bring it to life for those of us who don't have that knowledge. So thank you. Thank you for that. I really mean that. Um, but I wanted to give the, the example was, um, what we're talking about here is you can't unsee it, but, but you, since you can't unsee it, then what's the point and what's the value of it? Well, remember when you watched, the, you know, I can give many examples, but, um, when, when, you know, uh, what was the movie, um, Shyamalan's movie, um, Sixth Sense, right? Mm -hmm. You know, once you see that ending, you can't, you can't go back you, and watch you, it again. When you rewatch the movie. Yeah, without it. Yeah. Right. But you can't unsee it, but it makes you it richer. Yeah. And, and, and you now are seeing it in you a different context. Yeah. And that doesn't, you don't mm -hmm. lose it because it's still a great story. Right. And it just gives it a fuller meaning. And, and yeah, so that's how, that's, that's what how it, I, I mean, that's that. what it means to make disciples. I mean, the first time you're kind of blown away, the second time you go back and you start analyzing like, wow, that's so cool. I can't even believe that. And that's really, I think what the Bereans are doing. Uh, they're not being skeptical of Paul. They're looking and they're like, really, is that really what it's, oh, what? it's exactly what I can't believe that that's what it says. You know, yeah. I think that's what they're doing. And that's, and that's the definition of discipleship. And that's what Jesus called us to do is to make disciples. And how do you make disciples? Well, through this very kind of discussion. And uh, we need more of it in our churches, not just this kind of discussion, but also mm -hmm. apologetics so that we can know that we're going back into yeah. the scriptures. We understand we can trust that this has not been, as the skeptics claim, changed multiple times by kings yeah. throughout the years to fit their political agendas, because that's that's just demonstrably untrue just for those of you who are watching we're not gonna we, maybe we need to do a show on apologetics at, at some point but uh, mm -hmm. there are so many copies that you can use to cross-reference the older text to older text that can cross-reference the translations they th that look the bible is accurately preserved yes even over all these centuries um, there, there is one other thing I want to throw in here, and this is just another cool geek thing from the uh, the Canaanite text at Ugarit. Um, the two deeps at uh, out of the Baal cycle, referencing uh, the uh, perhaps the 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 ocean above, the clouds that uh, surrounded Mount Hermon, and the the deep below, or perhaps as uh, is an Israeli scholar who uh, mm -hmm. has analyzed some of these texts, Baruch Margalit was the one who argued that uh, the Sea of Galilee is perhaps the other deep that uh, so you know yeah it, it does really make uh, he wasn't trying to make that point but if you take that and apply it to uh, the new testament jesus walking on the water and calming the storm it's like <laughs> and then of course he goes right from there and uh, drives the demons out of legion the, the garrison demoniac so you know in one fell swoop he's uh, taking on chaos the storm god Baal, and then uh the the spirits of the giants who were destroyed in the flood 
But in uh, yeah. the Canaanite text, KTU 1.10, which is titled Baal, the heifer, and Anat, who is the war goddess. Uh, Anat, uh, see, the uh, uh, Baal indeed set his face toward the shores of Shemak, filled with wild oxen. Virgin Anat spread her wings. She spread her wings and winged her way toward the shores of Shemak, filled with wild oxen. Shemak is probably what Josephus called Lake Semiconitis, which is Lake Hula which, according to the Bale cycle, is filled with wild oxen, or perhaps water buffalo, which apparently was the case until the Israelis drained that uh, marsh back in the 1950s. So, um, again, we've got this connection to the, uh, the, the cattle, the oxen, the aurochs, perhaps, and uh, this region that, uh, you, you, as you pointed out early on, Doug, Psalm 29 identifies as the location of all of this uh, supernatural where activity. the storm is ending. Yeah, the storm yeah. ends right here. The valley of the shadow of death. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Okay, well, I, I can see I've got more work to do on the uh, revision before we turn in the manuscript to the editor. <laughs> I think we're in 50 minutes. Let me let me uh, just, I, I'm really interested in this for whatever reason, that, that we would have um, divine counsel stuff not taking us in this direction. And, and I know we're thinking about doing a show with, uh, on kind of Dr. Heiser, uh, in an upcoming episode and, and people, you know, kind of picking on him and, and us wanting to, uh, not, not, well, kind of, kind of come to his defense and, and just take the best of their arguments and look at that. But maybe this kind of a, could be a teaser for that because, um, when I, you, you know, as much as the weird stuff that we talk about, uh, <laughs> in the mythology and the, the monsters and all that stuff, when I first read Mike's book, when it was out on his website and he called it the myth that is true, I can tell you it wasn't that stuff that caught my attention. It was the, uh, it was the stuff that he did with, uh, the name, the angel, of the Lord, the glory, the word, um, uh, the arm, the shepherd, all this kind of stuff that I was just like, wow, that's incredible. And when you, when you learn that the Targums, for example, and we still have, what they were doing when they, when they would come across the passage where they were like, uh, in, in their high philosophy, Greek philosophy of divine simplicity and stuff, like they couldn't deal with God directly interacting with humanity in a text. And so they would insert certain words like the memra in order to be yeah. kind of a buffer between God and man. And they, they do this with the name, they do it with the glory, they do it with all this stuff. And it's into this that church fathers like Justin Martyr in the second century come along and say, I'm going to use this, this is to, to Judd's point, I'm going to use this exact thing that you guys are teaching to show you why this is Christ and why you guys always knew that it was Christ. And somebody <laughs> in church asked me today, well, Doug, what do you think happened? Like, how did we lose this? And I said, well, I think quite honestly— that we know, uh, and this comes right from Mike's dissertation stuff, that and to Alan Segal's book on the on the two powers in heaven, um, and Segal was a Jewish scholar, and he's the one that says this. He wasn't even a Christian, and he goes, "Yeah, well, what happened was there was this undercurrent, uh, uh, kind of a minority view within Judaism of a kind of a binitarianism in the Old Testament, for lack of a better term, so kind of a uh, latent early form of Trinitarianism." And the and all these Jews started converting to Christianity, and so you know when the temple is destroyed and they lose their religion, all of a sudden these guys got they got on top of this and like we're going to stamp this out now once and for all. It's not going to happen. We are not going to lose our religion to this guy and this sect called Christianity, this cult. And so they started tampering with their text and they started making these slight adjustments like the sons of God in Deuteronomy 32, eight and saying, no, that's really the sons of Israel or taking yeah. a genealogy and compressing the numbers, just dropping out the word, the number 100. And all of a sudden you have 650 years difference in the Septuagint and the Masoretic text. Why do they do this? Well, it's because there were these Christians going around saying that Jesus was Melchizedek in the old Testament. Well, no, he couldn't have been that he was Shem problem solved because we've just eliminated the time frame and, like, they're doing this in really little ways, and the church fathers are totally aware that that's what's happening. Okay, so it's like, well, they know it, but at some point in time in the church, we lost this worldview. How? And I think what happened was, 
there was this desupernaturalization that took place in rabbinical Judaism when they were writing Talmud. And over the course of interacting with Gentiles for 200 years, the, the Judaism of Jesus's day had been totally transformed into this Unitarianism that we still to this day have. And that influenced Christians in the way that they were dealing with the text in the way that they were doing apologetics. And next thing you know, they're fighting over, you know, they're having to deal with heretics and Gnosticism and stuff. And we just lost the worldview. And what I want to tell people is that that's what happened. We lost the worldview. This is not something that I'm making up and bringing to the text. It's something that scholarship is showing. And man, I, I published three books from Puritans showing that this is ex like 300 years before Alan Segal came along. They knew what was going on. Hmm. They knew this stuff. They, they were well aware of what, the, what they, had, they had done to their text, and they were Christological, Christ-centered in the Old Testament. And like, this is what, the, this is the power of our faith. And we need to recover it. And it's, I'm not ashamed of that. And it frustrates me to no end that we, that we could ever use Mike's work in a way that would cause us to go, no, I don't, I don't think that we should really, we need to be careful there about saying Jesus. No, we don't. You need to do it right, <laughs> but you don't need to be careful in terms of, no, you can't really see yeah. him there because they didn't see him. I just think that that's, yeah. I, I just think that that's why Christianity is dead, yeah. man. We've lost the life of the son of God in the church in the right mm -hmm. way. Yeah. And, and yeah. you so, see it in the Psalms, even in the Psalms of David, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand mm -hmm. until I make your enemies a footstool beneath my feet. Yeah. And the, and the New Testament is using this all the time in their apologetics in the New Testament. And it's like, you come along and you get modern Protestant conservative scholarship thing. Well, they were just interpreting that because they had inside information. You don't have the right to do what they did. I've heard people say this. No, Jesus taught me how to interpret the Bible. That's what Luke is telling you. <laughs> well, it's not a secret Gnostic information for the apostles. I mean, it's for all of us Christians. Jesus wants us to see him there. He got mad at his own disciples for not doing it. He got right. mad at the Pharisees for not doing it. Then he tells us how to do it. Then he gives us all these New Testament books that show you them doing it. And what do we do? We turn around and do the opposite. It's a mind blower. <laughs> well, I think the Heiser episode is going to be pretty lively. Should be a lot of fun. It could be. It could yeah, be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah, because it's predicated yeah, yeah. with Not two, one, but two, two so homilies the from Doug right. Van Dorn. I've got it out of my system, guys. Thanks for letting me do Psalm 29, because it's, well it's right on point to this. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Doug Van Dorn, pastor of the Reformed Baptist Church in Northern Colorado mm -hmm. in Boulder, and author of numerous books, including Giant Sons of the Gods, Brian Goodell, and let me, best-selling author. Let me say author. one oh. thing about this, Derek, uh, just okay. about the sermon, because I uh, actually have our sermons online on our website. Send and I have this sermon from Psalm 29 there. And so it's rbcnc.com. And then just go to the Sermons Old Testament Psalm Sermons. Reformed Baptist Church in Northern Colorado. Google it. It'll come up. And you can just read this. You know, read the psalm and the, and the stuff that they did. For I will a lot put of a those link. ideas I brought up are there. I'll put a link in the notes below this video or audio, wherever you're watching or listening, so you can uh, click on that and check that out. Uh, Brian Gadawa, he's the best-selling author, award-winning screenwriter, his most recent, the theological thriller, Cruel Logic, and Dr. Judd Burton, our friendly neighborhood PhD, director of the Institute of Biblical Anthropology. Fellows, uh, next month, looking forward to it already. We'll talk with you, talk with you again soon. Check the notes below this podcast, whether you're watching or listening, and you'll find links to the websites for Doug, Judd, and Brian. And uh, they'll be back next month as we continue this Iron and Myth series. Uh, it's, uh, I, I love the way Brian put it in this program. I'm so glad I watched this show. I learned something every time, and I'm, I'm right there with him. Coming up, uh, did President Biden's uncle get eaten by cannibals in Papua New Guinea? No. Uh, that and uh, more as a view from the bunker continues straight ahead. My name is Charles Cullen. They call me the philosopher killer. Some call me insane. But Aristotle said that no genius has ever existed without a touch of madness. Some say I'm evil. But I say I make my victims face the consequences of their own ideas. What about you? Could you defend your beliefs?
if your life depended on it. Cruel Logic, The Philosopher Killer. A brilliant theological thriller novel by Brian James Gadawa. Readers are saying, the most thrilling novel you will read this year. A page turner with shocking twists. Get it now at Amazon.com in Kindle paperback and audiobook. Summer reading season is just around the corner. We want to help you get ready. You can buy fiction, you can buy nonfiction through the Gilbert House store, whichever you want. All of our books are 40% off, 40%. That includes all eight novels of the Red Wing mm -hmm. Saga. Book nine is coming, probably early summer. My two novels, and then of course all of our nonfiction stuff, mm -hmm. including our most recent books, Giants, Gods, and Dragons, The Second Coming of Saturn, and Veneration, a deep dive into the cult of the Nephilim. April and May, you get 62 days, yeah, no, absolutely. 61. That's... April only has 30. <laughs> Regardless, through the end of May, 40% off on all of our books at the Gilbert House store. Available only online. Go to gilberthouse.org slash store. You'll find all the prices slashed on our books. 40% off. gilberthouse.org slash store. And thank you for your prayers and support. Talking the walk every Sunday night from the beautiful Missouri Ozarks. This is A View from the Bunker. I'm Derek Gilbert. You'll find us online at vftb.net. Our web hub where everything we do is gilberthouse.org, gilberthouse.org. If you're so inclined, that's where you'll find a link to contribute to help support what we are doing here. DerekPGilbert.com, my main website. On social media, you find us on X, formerly Twitter, at View from Bunker or at Derek Gilbert, D E R E K. The first name there uh, on uh, Facebook view from the bunker truth social get me we get her at Derek P Gilbert and on threads Matt. YouTube youtube.com slash at Gilbert house at Gilbert house the address on YouTube subscribe share click the bell for notifications then please cancel proof yourself by uh, downloading our free mobile app this brings all of our video and audio content right into your smartphone or tablet more than four hours a week I think See, an hour here, we get half hour of Unraveling Revelation, an hour of the Gilbert House Fellowship Bible Study, and an hour of PID Radios. It's about three and a half hours a week, and uh, longer if we blather. But also classic programs dating back to when we launched this whole venture out of a back bedroom back in 2005. We've been podcasting since, <laughs> since Apple was begging for people to submit podcasts to the iTunes store. And now everybody and their brother has a podcast. Well, we're still here and we're still crabby. So thank you for uh, taking time out of your schedule to watch or listen. Well, this week, boy, uh, I I'm not going to try to make a joke about this because it really isn't funny. My mother has dementia and she's a little farther down the road than President Biden is. But what he did this week, twice, once in Scranton and again the same day, Wednesday, in Pittsburgh in telling a story that I think he believes is true about his uncle Ambrose Finnegan, or Uncle Bosey as they called him, being shot down as a pilot of a single-engine plane over Papua New Guinea, which is the island north of uh, Australia during World War II. And he said at both of these places that they never found the body because the place where he was shot down had a lot of cannibals, no joke, the implication being that Uncle Bosey was eaten by cannibals. This is an example of what, um, and again, bear in mind, I'm not a medical professional. I'm just witnessing this in a close family member so I can relate to it. When the boundary between reality and imagination begins to break down, uh, you, you wind up with stories like this that they, absolutely believe are true, that you know for a fact just are not. But you can't argue with the person because to them that is as real as me talking to you right now or what you had for lunch today. It's absolutely firmly ingrained in their memory, but because of the disease that is progressing, the, um, 
the memories are just not uh, trustworthy any longer. So this touched off a minor diplomatic headache for the State Department, who had to try to calm the, uh, the people of Papua New Guinea, who did not appreciate being characterized as uh, savage cannibals. Uh, the fact of the story is that Ambrose Kennedy, um, or Finnegan, excuse me, Ambrose Finnegan, was a passenger on a twin, en- a twin engine plane that lost power in both engines. Uh, north of Papua New Guinea and ditched at sea. But sadly, because they'd lost power in both engines, were not able to ditch successfully. And uh, of the four members on the plane, only the engineer, the flight engineer, was able to escape. Uh, He was not a pilot, he was not shot down, and he was not eaten by cannibals. But again, to President Biden, that is real. Now, sadly, those who are on his team are tasked with cleaning up this mess, including, uh, again, the State Department. But spokesperson Karine Jean-Pierre, who was asked about this by Peter Doozy of Fox News on Thursday, why did the president tell this story and then tell it a second time? And Karine Jean-Pierre, now, she doesn't have the excuse of age or dementia to hide behind. She tried to turn it around on Doocy and make this about the, the, the problem not with the president telling this story that was factually untrue, his staff not intercepting him after the first telling of the story in Scranton said, um, Mr. President, maybe um, don't tell that story the next time. But then he repeated it in Pittsburgh. Uh, the, the problem is that reporters dared to ask about it. Now, you know as well as I do that had Donald Trump said something that was factually untrue, the media would have been all over it and held it up as an example of why he's unfit for office. In the minds of the media, because it's a Democrat in the White House, well, okay, he just got a few details wrong. That's just Joe being Joe. And really, the problem is you for daring to ask this question, and how dare you besmirch the memory of one who was serving our nation? Okay, all right, whatever. Um. My takeaway from this, again, is one with a close family member who is suffering through this and watching how it's affecting him. Joe Biden should not have been allowed to run in 2020. His family should have stepped up. Jill, his brother James, son Hunter, somebody in the family should have stepped up and said, don't do this. But if you remember the list of candidates that were running for the Democratic nomination in 2020, Biden, to independent voters, was the least objectionable. And so they've embarked on this four-year history of elder abuse to put him in the White House and enact their their plans, Um, Biden governing far to the left of anything that he purported to believe during his 32 years in the Senate. And uh, to those people who are behind this sad example of elder abuse, Bless your pointy little heads. A few conferences to tell you about. If you have not yet signed up for Skywatch TV's virtual conference, Confronting the Darkness, you can still do so and still get 90 days access from the moment you sign up. That's at uh, DefenderConference.com. I've got a uh, presentation in there, Sharon, as well, along with Jonathan Kahn, Carl Gallops, Dr. Judd Burton, Messianic Rabbi Zeph Port. Got to watch Judd's presentation today because his topic on the location of Babel is Really need to dig into that. I think that dovetails with some of the work that I put into uh, Second Coming of Saturn. And of course, uh, Tom Horn's final presentation, recorded prior to his uh, illness last fall. The Prophetic Signs in the Heavenlies Conference. If you were not able to join us in Dallas, you can still access the streaming video and uh, take advantage of that. You can uh, check that out, sign up, and get uh, the streaming video of my presentation along with. Um, Paul Begley, Colonel David Giamono, Pastor Casper McLeod, David Hevner, Dave Hodges, Michael Bodea, uh, John Moore, um, Doug Thornton, David Paxton. David Paxton, fascinating stuff. Uh, that's at hearthewatchmen.com, hearthewatchmen.com. In June, we're going out a couple of times. We'll be at the uh, Mysteries of the Bible Verse Conference in Cincinnati, June 7th and 8th. This is at the Marriott, Air, uh, the Marriott Cincinnati Airport, so it's actually in Hebron, Ohio, just across the Ohio from uh, Cincinnati proper. Basically, it's almost on the airport grounds. 
which is really convenient for those of us traveling in for it. Anyway, um, Mysteries of the Bible Verse Conference, I'll be speaking there twice, along with uh, our good friend Rudy Landa, Pastor Mike Hoggard, Mac Dominic, Josh Davis, Greg Patton, and Micah Van Hus, a recent guest on this program. More information at swrc.com, swrc.com. June 21st through 23rd, we'll be at... The His Call Ministries uh, retreat at uh, Finley River Ranch, Sparta, Missouri. Sharon and I speaking that weekend. Our theme will be The Gates of Hell, based on our forthcoming book coming out fourth quarter. Finally got that manuscript turned in. It's now in the editor's hands. We'll see uh, how that comes out. But if all goes well, it should be out in time for uh, fourth quarter this year. His Call Ministries, you can find out more online, hiscallministries.com, hiscallministries.com. Reserve your place because it's a... uh, uh, a cozy location. So, uh, and it, again, just Sharon and me speaking Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday morning. And again, hiscallministries.com. And the Go Therefore Conference, late July. Looking forward to that. The Harvest Revival Center in Brookville, Ohio. That's suburban Dayton. Wonderful facility. Pastor Neil Peterson making it available for the conference. Dr. Michael Lake, uh, sadly, has had to uh, back out because of some um, issues with his eyes. He, uh, doesn't like to drive. It's better to be able to see where you're going when you're driving. So uh, sadly, he has had to step back. But uh, Ellie Marzulli will be there, Pastor Paul Begley, Pastor Carl Gallops, Dr. Judd Burton, Sharon and me, Dr. Uh, Michael uh, uh, Spaulding. And uh, we are hoping that uh, Greg Reed will be able to attend. He's on the schedule. Uh, he suffered a pretty serious accident while bicycling a couple months ago. And he's in the Uh, He's rehabbing right now and trying to get better. So uh, we pray that he will feel well enough and be able to attend in July. But uh, you can find out more online. Uh, Streaming video also available for this one as well. GoThereforeConference.com. GoThereforeConference.com. Next spring, we will be in Israel with, uh, you know, God willing, with Doug Van Doren, Dr. Judd Burton, and Timothy Albarino, rolling all of these uh, uh, guests from the uh, this year's conference, which obviously had to be pushed off because of conflict. Uh, we're going to do it all next year, April, or March 25th through April 3rd, with an optional three-day extension over to Jordan. More information at gilberthouse.org slash travel. That's gilberthouse.org slash travel. Thank you again for taking time out of your schedule to watch or listen wherever you're consuming this podcast. If you're watching again, uh, please download our free mobile app to cancel proof yourself and then uh, if you're listening whether it's at uh, apple podcast google podcast soon to be youtube music amazon music iHeartRadio, spotify speaker stitcher uh pandora or uh, i think we're on audible now yes confirmation we are on audible as well um please give us a, a good review or uh, just a good rating and thank you again for taking time out of your schedule to do this our announcer DC Good and A View from the Bunkers, a production of Gilbert House Ministries, released under Creative Commons Attribution, not commercial, no derivatives, 4.0 international license. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And good night, Oliver, wherever you are. I'm Derek Gilbert. This is A View from the Bunker.